Well, good morning, Rotary District 7770, and welcome to Conversations with Rotary Action People for Monday, August 2nd. My name is Donald Hovis. I am your CRAP host, and I'm from the Chicora Rotary Club in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Uh, I want to give a shout out to Mary Gask. Uh, Five Points Rotary in Columbia for leading last week's C-Rap. She did a phenomenal job. If you missed last week's C-Rap, you can obviously watch it on Facebook or you can watch it over on our YouTube channel. Uh, it was uh, with District Governor Paul Walter going, o- going over his top 10 for the district. Great presentation uh, and great job, Mary. Appreciate that. So today is August 2nd. Uh, and it's been pretty hot in South Carolina, so I think this is kind of ironic that today is National Ice Cream Sandwich Day. So uh, if you like ice cream sandwiches, make sure you get out and uh, enjoy one today. Also, the Olympics have been underway for quite a while, and it's been very exciting to watch. Uh, Team USA is doing phenomenally well. Uh, I think they're up by maybe 10 medals in the medal count. So in the chat box, I want you to introduce yourself with your name, your Rotary Club, and what's your favorite thing about the Olympics? Like, what's the sport that you have to watch? You know what I mean? I'll be honest with you. Mine's beach volleyball. I love watching beach volleyball. Uh, there's two reasons. One, and Ed may not even know this, there is actually a guy who's won a gold medal before that has a house in Myrtle Beach. Wow. Uh, it's Bill Dahlhauser. Uh, and actually on Ocean Boulevard right now on about 40th Avenue North, there's this big, huge banner that says, go Phil Dalshauer and his partner. So pretty cool. fun fact, beach volleyball is my favorite, but uh, love the Olympics. So guys, we're joined today by uh, what I think is uh, probably the best meteorologist, obviously in our area, but I'm going to say in the state of South Carolina. Um, He's, he's a close friend of mine. He just was at our Rotary Club, so uh, you're in for a great presentation. I mean, the guy even has a, his own bobblehead, y'all. Like, look here. <laughs> right? He has his own bobblehead. Yeah, he, out so, too. Funny. he has his own hashtag, right? Like, that's what Ed said, right? I mean, this guy is phenomenally. So, to talk about hurricanes from uh, WPDE ABC 15, that's the ABC affiliate in the Myrtle Beach area, let's give a warm welcome to Ed Piotrowski. Thank you, everybody. You're way too kind, Donald. I'm just happy that the check doesn't bounce on a daily basis. Got to keep the family fed, right? Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and, and you know, talk to you guys a little bit about hurricanes, especially uh, where we've been uh, and where we're headed this hurricane season. So let me get to that. Always takes just a second to set that up and share. I think we're in business now, right, Donald? Wait a minute. I see your screen. All right. Just not the presentation, but I'm sure you got it coming up. Yes, here we go, slide. Whoops, wrong one. I gotta play from beginning. I don't have my glasses with me, which is terrible. Oh uh, gosh. There we go, I just had to slide, find that slide. Okay, can everybody see my screen okay? Yes, sir. All right, um, thank you very much for the introduction. So let's go ahead and get right into it so I don't bore you guys. and. Uh, the first thing we're going to do is kind of, now I don't know why I'm not able to, okay, there we go. All right. Usually I just hit my space bar and it moves on, but it was uh, not doing that. Anyway, a uh, little bit about past hurricanes in our area. And as we all know, it's been an incredible five years in our area. Of course, a lot of people remember Hurricane Florence more than anything else because of all the rainfall that it produced in our area. Uh, what's amazing about Hurricane Florence, when it was moving through Horry County and the rest of South Carolina, it was no stronger than a tropical storm. And a lot of people fear hurricane winds, which is, of course, a big deal, but it really is the rain uh, that is the calling card of many of these slow moving tropical systems that can cause catastrophic flooding, not only in our area, but pretty far inland as well. We had more rainfall from Hurricane Florence than we have seen in any other tropical system since 1950. And again, it was just a tropical storm moving through. So always remember that the amount of rainfall you get from a tropical system is not at all related to how strong it is, but how slow it's actually moving. Hurricane Hugo, those of you've been around a while, 
uh, may remember Hugo was a cat four at landfall, but because it was moving at 28 miles per hour, it did not dump a tremendous amount of rainfall. So flooding was not an issue with Hugo. It was all about the rain and wind with Hurricane Hugo. So there's Hurricane Florence. Uh, these are the rainfall totals that we experienced, almost two feet of rain over a couple of days in Loris. When you get that amount of rainfall in 48 hours, that's basically half the rainfall that we get in an entire year. So that's going to cause extensive flooding, and we certainly saw that in our area. Lumberton had 22 inches of rain. Even Myrtle Beach had over 10 inches of rain, which doesn't seem like a lot, but it is when you get it over a couple of days. That sent our rivers to record levels. Records that were broken were actually set just two years prior when Hurricane Matthew came through. And of course, those records were shattered by Hurricane Florence with the Waccamaw River, the Intracoastal Waterway, and all the other rivers you see here uh, breaking records for the highest they've ever been on record. And that too caused extensive flooding, as you can see here. This is the Rosewood community out near Sockesty, uh, right on the Intracoastal Waterway. And uh, they have flooded uh, similarly for the last three out of four years. So it's been an incredible run with catastrophic flooding in our area. And unfortunately, uh, on a globe that is warming, regardless of what you believe in terms of who's causing it, you're going to have bigger rain events. Uh, the warmer the globe is, the more amount of moisture it can actually hold. And we've also seen that even though hurricanes may not get stronger over time because of the, the globe actually warming, we have seen uh, plenty of proof that they slow down, and when they slow down, they produce a lot more rain like what you're seeing here. So this was out near Sockesty and in Conway when Florence came through. One of the things we always try to preach is, you know, respect the barricades and cones that you see on roads. Um, they're there for a reason. They're there to protect you. Often, right after a hurricane, people want to get out and explore or go see their property or whatever it may be, but water is still very, very high. It takes a long time for that water to recede sometimes, and you may not know what you're getting into. In a case like this, there was water over the road. The person drove into this water ha having no idea just how deep the water was and how much of the road was actually undermined. So this was the end result, but thankfully, nobody was actually hurt, uh, seriously hurt or killed with this particular accident. And something else to remember, after the hurricane passes, it takes DOT and emergency preparedness officials a little bit of time to get out there to inspect all the roads. So even if you don't see cones, if there's water on the road, turn around, don't drown. It's the mantra of the National Weather Service. It's what we try to preach all the time because you have no idea how deep that water is. And it only takes six inches to a foot of water to float your car. And if that gets floated off the road, into a raging river, bad things can happen and, and often it means death for some people. Uh, Florence fatalities, there was a total of 52, a majority of those in North Carolina, nine were in South Carolina and three in Virginia. What's remarkable to me is the amount of people that actually died after the hurricane. It's more that died in the hurricane, believe it or not. Direct uh, fatalities during Hurricane Florence was all related, at least 75% of them, to the incredible amount of flooding we had uh, because of the very heavy rainfall. But after the hurricane passes, there are medical issues. People are stressed. They want to get out and clean up their property. It's typically very hot and humid and bad things happen. We notice an uptick in heart attacks happening. Auto accidents because people get out there and they do rubbernecking. They're out there looking around, seeing what's going on and not paying attention to the road. Carbon monoxide poisoning is a big deal as well. People will start their generators actually in their homes or in their garages and that's a silent killer. It poisons you and unfortunately people die. Fire, obviously uh, electro electrocution is an issue as well. Sometimes there are power lines that are still live when, um, when the hurricane has passed and people don't realize that. So there are just as many hazards after a hurricane as there are during a hurricane. So you've always gotta be very careful and stay vigilant. In our viewing area, which covers all the counties you see here, we had five fatalities. Uh, two of those were in Eastern Marion County. A sheriff's truck went around a barricade, got caught in rushing water. And unfortunately, two of their passengers actually passed away because the uh, van was pushed off the road uh, and it overturned and the people inside drowned. Two people in Loris uh, died because of carbon monoxide, carbon monoxide poisoning. They uh, unfortunately started their generator in their house and there was one person in Georgetown County, who was driving down the road, encountered water, and his truck got uh, washed off the road, and unfortunately, he was found the next day. He had drowned. So uh, it doesn't seem like flooding would be that big of a deal, but it really is the number one killer in a hurricane, more so than wind. Storm surge has the potential to kill the most people, but most people do a good job of getting away from the immediate coast. 
Now, Florence was all about the rainfall. Hurricane Michael in 2018 that hit Florida was a category five, and it was all about the rainfall, I'm sorry, about the wind and the storm surge. This is just some of the video from that hurricane. You can see the very heavy rainfall, but there was really no flooding from this hurricane uh, because of heavy rainfall. All the flooding that occurred was because of storm surge and very high wind as well. It ripped off the roofs of some of the hotels and buildings in Mexico Beach, which of course is on the panhandle of Florida. Trees came down and what you're going to see here in a second is massive flooding. And this was caused by storm surge. This was, this was the very strong winds around the eye pushing the Gulf of Mexico ashore. And you're pushing that water ashore, it comes up seven to nine feet and on top of that, are battering waves. So it causes a tremendous amount of destruction and flooding. It almost looks like a 30 mile wide tornado had come through the panhandle of Florida in particular around Mexico Beach. Again, that's the Gulf of Mexico right there. That's not rainfall flooding and all that debris from the massive waves. And when all that water recedes, this is what's left, obliteration of so many buildings and homes within several hundred yards of the actual uh, shoreline itself. So. Uh, it's just massive, the destruction. And if, for those of you that were here during Hurricane Hugo, you probably remember what Garden City looked like. It looked very much like this. We had a 13 to 15 foot storm surge come ashore in Garden City, and that was devastating for the South Carolina coast. A little bit more about storm surge, because a lot of people often don't understand that. When we give you a forecast for storm surge, it's the amount of water from where you stand upward. So a three to six foot storm surge means six feet from where you're standing above ground. It's not from sea level. It's a, it's a above ground. So even if you're four feet above the ground, a three to six foot storm surge means it's going to be three to six feet above where you're actually standing, not uh, the four feet plus just a two, you know, plus two more. So always remember that it's above where you are standing or where your home is actually located. Here are some of the storm surges that we had with previous hurricanes. Dorian was around a three foot storm surge. Isaias, especially up near Cherry Grove, produced a four to six foot storm surge. And uh, that actually did quite a bit of damage in Cherry Grove and up toward Little River. Numerous cars were destroyed because of the salt water that got into those cars. And of course, still the benchmark hurricane is Hurricane Hugo, nine to 15 foot storm surge along the Grand Strand, nine feet up toward Little River, 15 feet as you head uh, southward toward Garden City and eventually down toward Polly's Island as well. The biggest storm surge with Hurricane Hugo was actually in Bulls Bay, that 20 foot storm surge. Think about that, two stories, 20 foot storm surge came ashore in Bulls Bay and it's still the highest storm surge to ever impact the Eastern United States. They've had bigger along the Gulf Coast, but for the East Coast, it is certainly uh, Hurricane Hugo's storm surge. And that can be very devastating as you saw, uh, like we had with Hurricane uh, Michael back in 2018 on the Florida Panhandle. So this was Hurricane Dorian from a couple of years ago. There's the uh, actual eye itself right here. Uh, we just missed out on the eye, which was a great thing because around the eye wall, that's where the most vicious thunderstorms are located where you get the heaviest rain and the most wind. Yes, we did have quite a bit of rain and wind with Dorian, uh, but the worst of it actually did stay offshore. And this is a good time to point out that we track a hurricane's eye, but remember, impacts are often felt hundreds of miles away from the center. So you may not get to the core of the hurricane, but you can still get tornadoes, flash flooding, uh, obviously very heavy rainfall and very high wind as well that can all cause damage. But the most significant damage typically occurs right around that eye wall itself. So we were fortunate with Hurricane Dorian uh, that it wasn't any worse. Uh, we did have some storm surge flooding though. This is Dorian storm surge flooding down near Little River. The water came through and in between the homes and into the roadways. And remember, this was only about a three foot storm surge. Can you, so you can imagine what kind of damage is going to be done when we have an even bigger one come through if we get a big hurricane. We know it's going to happen. Uh, we just don't know when it's going to happen. It could happen this year. It could happen 50 years from now. I hope it's a lot later in time than, than now because it has been a really tough five, six years along the South Carolina coast and really across South Carolina as well. Those of you that are far inland remember the great South Carolina flood of 2015. Tornadoes are an issue as well. This was a tornado that touched down in North Myrtle Beach and tornadoes in tropical systems uh, typically don't last very long. They spin up very quickly, spin down very quickly. But in that minute or so that they actually form, they can cause a lot of damage. We had some pretty significant damage uh, up in North Myrtle Beach when this funnel actually touched down. You can almost see some of the debris uh, that was flying around the system. So it was moving very quickly at well because of the strong hurricane winds. Uh, this was moving probably at 60 miles per hour. So it's very difficult to warn for a tornado in a tropical system, but because by the time they form and the radar sees it, 
uh, perhaps 30 seconds to a minute will pass and it covers a lot of ground in that short amount of time. Uh, you'll see that law enforcement pulls up here and when they do, they obviously stop. But if you look carefully, you'll actually see the funnel actually lift here. Uh, the sky gets a little bit brighter beneath here. So uh, this tornado was on the ground for about a minute and a half and that was it, but it did cause significant damage. And here comes law enforcement riding up and then you start to see a clearer sky there as the tornado actually lifts and begins uh, to move on. So just another hazard you have to worry about in hurricanes. Dorian produced over 14 inches of rain in Litchfield, but the difference with this hurricane was that we were very dry leading up to Dorian, which was a good thing. When Hurricane Florence came through, uh, we had been very, very wet. So it was already, the ground was already saturated. So we got a ton of flooding on top of what we already had uh, because of all the rain we had. We didn't have much flooding during Hurricane Dorian simply because we were very dry. And we've been pretty dry so far this summer, but that is going to change, at least for those of us near the coast. This week, uh, we're expecting rounds of heavy rainfall. It'll taper off as you head farther west, but we've got an old front that's stalling over the area and a trough over us, which will just uh, produce rounds of showers and storms that could total anywhere from I-95 to the coast, three to eight inches, closer to seven or eight inches near the coast. That's over the next three or four days. So. Flooding is possible, but it should be fairly minor since that uh, amount of rainfall is going to fall over three or four days. Uh, anyway, that's the forecast. Peak wind gusts with Hurricane Dorian, 60s along the coast. We are in the 30s and 40s farther inland. Typically, that kind of wind doesn't cause much damage. Uh, some trees will get knocked down. Some roofing may be uh, torn off in small pieces, but typically 60 mile per hour winds are not a big deal. And then last year, we, of course, had Hurricane Isaias. And, you know, before the hurricane started, I go, this will be the hurricane that impacts us because it took me forever to figure out how to pronounce Isaias. And I honestly didn't get it right until the hurricane actually passed. But anyway, Isaias was actually a strengthening hurricane on approach to the North Carolina coastline. And the eye made landfall right in Ocean Isle. We were in the eye wall on the western side. But as you often hear us talk about a northward moving hurricane, the northeast quadrant is the worst part of the hurricane. And that's, as you can see, is where we had the deeper reds, where we had big time thunderstorms, heavy rain, and most of the wind. And here's a, a great example of just how strong the winds are on the northeast side. There's the actual track of Hurricane Isaias. Winds were gusting in the 70s, 80s, and even 90s east of the track, but west of the track, we had wind gusts in the 30s, 40s, and low 50s here. So we very much lucked out uh, when it came to wind. If this track had been about 20 miles to the west, we would have seen more significant wind damage, especially on the north end of the Grand Strand where Horry County actually sticks out. So I use this graph a, a lot too to pinpoint that I just told you that 20 miles can make all the difference in the world. And a five-day forecast cannot be that precise. That's why they have that cone of uncertainty or that big cone that you see. The average error on day five of a National Hurricane Center forecast is nearly 200 miles either side. You know, 50 miles can mean all the difference between sunshine and a raging hurricane sometimes, depending on the, the strength of the hurricane. That's why hurricanes, uh, hurricane forecasts are not made beyond five days because there's a lot of error involved. So that's why we don't really know where a hurricane is gonna precisely be until about a day out. But that's why we prepare you beforehand because there's a lot of uncertainty leading up to where a hurricane is actually going to make landfall. Hurricane Isaias did do some uh, storm surge flooding in Garden City, but if you've ever been to Garden City, it floods there if you spit. So uh, this is not unusual, even with a nor'easter in the wintertime around here. But again, you can see uh, that's no fun to be in storm surge. It's going underneath homes, it's undermining roads, and you know, driving through that could be issues for people. More storm surge flooding. It's never a good thing when you see the storm surge of the ocean coming into your uh, swimming pool. If it wasn't a saltwater pool before, it is now uh, because of all that uh, wave action and ocean coming ashore. And again, this was East Aies, only a four to five foot storm surge. And I say only because as you saw with Hurricane Hugo, it'd be a whole lot worse. All right. Elsa, of course, was the one tropical system that gave us a lot of rainfall this year, but it was actually rainfall we needed simply because we had been so dry. Elsa came through with up to three and a half inches of rain in our area, and we actually had higher wind gusts with Elsa than we did with Hurricane Isaias, and it's simply because Elsa came literally right over us, uh, and that made all the difference in the world. It actually tracked just inland, so we were able to get stronger wind gusts. We were on the uh, stronger right side of a tropical storm as it came through our area. So a quick look back at 2020 before we look forward to the rest of this hurricane season. It was quite a year. We had 30 named storms. It looks like a huge bowl of spaghetti on this map here. 30 named storms is a record. 
Uh, the average, at least a 30 year average up until this year was for 12 named storms to form, six hurricanes from that, and three major hurricanes to form. That's in an average season. We had 13, thir uh, 30, 13, and six last year, one for the record books as well. Something to remember, six or seven though of the tropical systems that formed in 2020 only lived about a day. Uh, so there have been much more impactful hurricane season in terms of really catastrophic hits from major hurricanes. Uh, but still, this was a, a bad hurricane season for a lot of folks. 2020 beat 2005 for most named storms. We did not beat 2005 for the most hurricanes. That still holds a record of 15. There were seven major hurricanes in 2005. That's category three or higher. And of course, we had six in 2020. But the only statistic that matters is how many of those tropical systems actually hit you. And unfortunately, the United States got hit by 12 tropical storms and hurricanes last year, shattering the old record of nine set back in 1916. These were all the landfalls. Here in South Carolina, we were pretty lucky. We had Bertha early in the season. And then, of course, Hurricane Isaias on August 4th, which is pretty close to today. Uh, and of course, most of the hurricanes actually made landfall in the Gulf of Mexico. So Louisiana was particularly hard hit. They had uh, five tropical systems hit them. Three were hurricanes, two were major hurricanes, and uh, one was a, not a major hurricane, but it was just an awful year for the Gulf Coast. So, you know, again, no matter how busy a hurricane season is, it only takes one hitting you to make it a really bad season. Last year, we went through the standard alphabet. Now I know there's 26 letters in the alphabet, but we only use 21. Um, and it's simply because it's not only America, but uh, the countries of Central America, the countries of the Caribbean, South America, who have a say in what the names are going to be. And uh, Spanish and French in particular, uh, they don't have very many names that begin with Q, U, X, Y, and Z. So they decided to exclude those names. So anyway, when we got to the end of 21, we had to move on to the Greek alphabet. Problem was we have to retire some of the storms because they were so powerful when some of these came through during, uh, during the uh, latter part of the hurricane season, but you can't retire an, an, an actual letter of an alphabet. So what they've decided to do this year is to actually have a second list. We've been through ELSA already. Hopefully we don't make it to the end of this list, but if we do, we'll move on to the second list that begins with Adria and then eventually to Braylon and on down uh, the list here. Uh, we are way behind where we were this year, which is good. I think at this time last year, we had already 10 named storms and right now we're sitting at five. But again, only takes one to hit you. Here's the actual forecast for the rest of this season. Uh, this does already include the five that formed and uh, the one hurricane that formed. So in an average season, this is the new average for the last 30 years is 14, seven and three. We're expecting up to 20 named storms. That would be an additional 15 based on what we've had already. Nine hurricanes, which would be an additional eight. We haven't had any major hurricanes yet. So perhaps up to four major hurricanes. And here's the proof that, uh, you know, the amount of hurricanes that form doesn't really matter. It only takes one to hit you. In 2010, we had 19 named storms. One of the busiest seasons on record. Uh, only one tropical storm actually hit the United States. Then in 1983, we only had four named storms all season long, but that was the year Galveston and Houston got hit by a category three hurricane. And a lot of you pr probably remember Hurricane uh, Andrew back in 1992, a category five hurricane that hit South Florida. It was one of only seven named storms that entire year, and it didn't form until the middle of uh, August. So the very first named storm of the season in the Atlantic in 1992 didn't form until the middle of August. So if I told you there's only going to be four and seven named storms. Most of you think you're never going to get hit. That's probably what people in South Florida thought as well. So a little bit about what uh, makes a hurricane season active or not. Um, most often the pattern that will make for an active season or an inactive season is El Nino and La Nina. In an El Nino year, which is what we would like, but we're not in, the waters warm off the South American coast. When that happens, we get a lot of wind shear across the Caribbean, the Atlantic, and the Gulf of Mexico. When that happens, we get decreased tropical activity because I know the winds get very strong in hurricanes, but they need a very pristine environment with no wind shear. In other words, not tilting the hurricane and the thunderstorms to actually survive. So when you get a lot of wind cutting across the hurricane, it prevents it from venting properly, and they can actually collapse and die or not even form at all. So you see a reduction in the number of tropical storms and hurricanes when you have a lot of wind shear. The opposite of that is La Nina, which is kind of where we were last year and where we are this year as well. The waters are cooler off the uh, South American coast, so you don't have as many thunderstorms out here, and that lightens the wind shear 
uh, creating a more pristine environment for tropical storms and hurricanes to actually form. So that's one ingredient that we have this year that would lead to a more active season. One of the things that uh, has been good so far is the, the main development region. That's the area from the African coast through the Caribbean and into the Gulf of Mexico. Waters have actually been near or slightly below normal. They're still warm enough to produce a hurricane, but if you don't have incredibly warm water, sometimes you don't get the really big hurricanes or a ton of hurricanes to actually form. That could change in a week though. If the winds were to lighten up across the Atlantic Ocean, uh, so what happens there, let me explain that. When the winds are strong moving from east to west, they turn the water over. So you get upwelling, cooler water from below. If those winds happen to lighten up, the surface of the water will warm up very quickly over a week's time. So we'll see what happens as we head through the peak of the hurricane season. Our water temperature is fluctuating between 83 and 85 right now. I forgot to update the uh, actual box there. I should have moved it to August 1st, but it's warm, but not as warm as it was last year. And right now we're still very quiet in the tropics, which is very good news. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Uh, this past Friday, when I made this, we still had quite a bit of dry, dusty air coming off the African coast. And that dry, dusty air actually helps to evaporate moisture or soak up moisture that's in the air. So if you don't have that, it's very difficult for thunderstorms to actually form. This is pretty common in the month of July. We will typically see the stronger winds abate as we head through August and you have less dry, dusty air moving across the Atlantic Ocean. Something else that uh, a lot of people may not know about that that we often see in a hurricane season is the Madden Julian oscillation marching across the globe. Every 30, 60 days, this atmospheric wave moves around the entire globe. And back on July 22nd, it moved into our area. The suppress phase did. And the suppress phase just means the air is actually sinking. When the air sinks, you're not getting a whole lot of thunderstorm activity because air has to rise for that to happen. So we now have gone 23 days, I think, without uh, a named storm in the Atlantic, and it's simply because of the Madden Julian oscillation actually preventing that. What we are going to see as we head through the month of August is more of an enhanced phase begin to cross the Atlantic. And that simply means that the air is going to begin to rise more readily, and that could lead to a higher potential for tropical storms and hurricanes to actually form. Very little uh, to nothing is expected to form this week. There was hints of some stuff trying to develop this upcoming weekend or early next week off the African coast. Uh, we'll see if that's the case, but uh, chances are this very, very quiet period is going to come to an end here as we head through the month uh, of August. And then of course, activity typically peaks in the month of September. The historical peak of hurricane season is September 10th, but really that window from August 20th to October 10th, that's a 52 day period where we see more than half of our tropical storms, but more importantly, Importantly, two thirds of our hurricanes and 73% of all the major hurricanes, which are category three or higher. So that window of peak activity is still yet to come for our area. I mentioned September 10th here in South Carolina. A lot of you know, after Labor Day is when we often get most of our big hurricanes. Uh, you can see all the hurricanes that have come after September 10th and hit the South Carolina coast. Category two Floyd in 1999, Hugo September 22nd. A lot of people don't remember Hurricane Hazel, which was a category four that slammed into Little River uh, on October 15th. And we've actually had a hurricane on October 31st actually hit the South Carolina coast. It hit Garden City as a category two with 105 mile per hour winds. So just because we get past the peak doesn't mean it's all downhill. That's when we need to be most vigilant here in South Carolina based on our history. Something else to remember, and we're almost done here so you guys can ask some questions, uh, be vigilant this time of the year. Things can change very, very quickly. Uh, you know, the Hurricane Center will put out a forecast and, and as brilliant as they are, and they're the best in the world, uh, they for, those forecasts can change. In other words, they may say, uh, the forecast for this tropical storm is for it to become a hurricane, a category one in two days with 75 mile per hour winds. Well, over the course of time, uh, that's changed and it may develop very rapidly. We see rapid intensification a lot during the months of August and September. And my point here is that all four of the category five hurricanes that have hit the United States were just tropical storms three days prior. So they escalated very, very quickly and were incredibly damaging. And there were a lot of people that were caught off guard because they saw one forecast that said it was only gonna become a category one. They didn't pay attention the next day or the day after when the forecast actually changes. So just know that forecasts are going to change. A lot of you remember Hurricane Florence at one point was expected to be a category three or four making landfall on the North Carolina coast and it made landfall as a category one. So things can change. 
And don't sleep on a category one hurricane. They can be devastating. They can cause tons of damage and they kill people. 175 deaths just in the last 10 years from category ones. And that's mostly because people don't take them seriously. Most people do a good job of taking threes, fours, and fives seriously, but people blow off category ones and twos and unfortunately people die. Focus on the hazards, not the category. Category is simply based on the wind, but as I've shown you here today, wind, rain, storm surge, and tornadoes are all deadly hazards in a hurricane. So focus on the hazards that we described to you, not so much what the category is going to be. Obviously, the higher the category, the more potential there is for damage, but you know, category one, as I mentioned, can still cause a lot of deaths from flooding itself. All right, let me uh, set this up real quick before I show you this video. Last two pieces of video are just from Hurricane Hunters. First one I'm gonna show you is really cool because it shows uh, the, the camera in the Hurricane Hunter actually has a uh, gimbal on it. So it's a very steady video. It's not really that steady, but it's gonna steady it out for you. But they're in the eye wall of the hurricane and they can't see two feet in front of them. Then they fly through the eye wall and you'll see it just open up into this magnificent eye of Hurricane Michael back in 2018 when it was a category five. So they can't see two feet in front of them, then bam, here they come, they come through the wall and there's the eye itself. You can't see the whole thing, but you can obviously see the curvature of the eye, crystal clear blue skies and towering storms that can be 60, 70,000 feet high in the air. Pretty impressive. I'll show that to you one more time. Okay. So again, they can't see two feet in front of them. Here's the window pane in case you were wondering. And then boom, they're into the eye itself. This is when they're dropping uh, what we call drop zones to see what the central pressure is in the hurricane. And these hurricane hunters are incredibly valuable. Uh, they take uh, CAT scans of the hurricane. They basically are seeing where the heaviest rain is, how far out the strong winds extend and so on and so forth. And because that data is so useful for the hurricane models, uh, you can actually reduce the uh, amount of warning necessary. In other words, if there's a hundred mile part of the coastline that's in a warning, if you decrease that by just a mile, you save a community a million dollars and they can decrease that by many miles. So your tax dollars pay for this, but it's well worth it because it saves communities a lot of money. Uh, the hurricane hunters that we used are often uh, P3 Orions or C-130s. And I believe that was a P3. Don't quote me on that. So here's what it looks like to be in the cockpit of a hurricane hunter when you don't have anything to stabilize the camera. And you can see how incredibly turbulent it is, but these men and women are pros and they're very brave and it's actually very safe. Um, they know what they're doing. They've never lost a plane in over 40, 50 years of flying through hurricanes. And again, they get incredibly valuable data. If you look down the bottom here, there's an actual radar on board. I'll show it to you one more time. So there's the radar. You can see where they are right there in that strong uh, area of yellow, reds and oranges. But they do that so they can get the most accurate reading of how strong the winds actually are. All right, so that's kind of everything I had. So um, Donald, if you wanna take over and see if anybody has any questions, um, I'm game for that. Yes, we will allow for three questions. Three, qu we have time for three questions. So if you wanna come off a of mute and ask a question, we have room for three questions. Anyone? <laughs> You always cover a lot. So I will throw this out there. If you're All not right. in the Myrtle Beach area, you should definitely follow Ed. I will tell you, Ed Piotrowski, WPDE, uh, is his Facebook page. He does a tremendous job. Uh, and when there's a hurricane coming, he comes on and does a Facebook Live and goes over all the details and pretty much. much on TV. Great. Exactly, exactly. So. And I'll also echo this, and Ed, you can throw this out there. I think you would appreciate this. Is you know we all have apps on our phone, right? To track the weather, but Ed will tell you your local TV weather app is probably a lot better than the Weather Channel or AccuWeather or those other things. So uh, download your local weather app because they actually put the forecast in the computer. The other ones they don't. So that's exactly right, Donald. And I think Bob has a question there. Uh, this is more of a comment. Um, in, in, in the uh, tropical storm that came through about three weeks ago, um, I'm down here in Buford. And, right. Uh, right. They weren't they weren't expecting much. I actually drove to Myrtle Beach the uh, day before. When that storm came through, a tornado hit here in Buford in right. um, in Port Royal. Um, they did a fair amount of damage. They later reported that there was an eight to 
10 foot wall of water that did a couple of, uh, of, of board cruise ships. And the cruise ship hit the huge pilings at the old port facility. So what was, what was, what was anticipated to be a pretty insignificant uh, uh, event, and, and generally was, turned out to be locally very, very serious. So just, just That's a very good point. point. You never know. I mean, you know, some of these tropical storms overall for the entire community are not going to be a big deal, but you always have to prepare for the worst because somebody is going to get the worst case scenario of that tropical system. And that's exactly what happened in, in Buford. I recall seeing those spinning thunderstorms down there. We were lucky that we didn't have those here, but you know, for the people that experienced that, that was uh, very, very nasty and obviously catastrophic for some. Any other questions? We got time for one more. Looks like Mary. I'll, I'll ask one more. Um, Ed, why why do all the models, why are they so divergent um, early on? Now late, you know, when 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 the storm gets close, obviously they 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 start to be more consistent, but why are they so divergent early on? That's a great question. Uh, most of the tropical systems that form obviously form in the deep tropics where the steering currents are very, very, uh, uh, very uh, low, if you will. They're very light. And so the hurricane forecast models have difficulty when the steering currents are very weak, knowing which particular high pressure or low pressure is going to be more dominant. As these tropical systems start to gain latitude, they start to move into much faster and much more prominent steering currents. So it becomes very obvious where they're eventually going to go. And you'll often see when something's recurving, all those lines are stacked up on one another. But when they're in the, uh, when they're in the Atlantic or the Gulf of the Caribbean, once you get out a couple of days, they start to really spread out. So it's not only the steering currents, but also a small error in a model like this Tomorrow, you don't see much change in any of the models, but that error can grow to be this big or even bigger as you go out in time. So the models will start out close and they'll fan out over time. And that's why, you know, when you look at a seven, eight, nine day forecast model and what we call ensembles, which is multiple runs of the same model, it'll look like a massive bowl of spaghetti because it's showing the hurricane going anywhere. So two things to remember as you gain latitude, the steering currents typically get stronger as it becomes more apparent what those steering currents are going to be, the forecast will become clearer as well. Well, I've, I've always heard, um, and I heard this from a senior EPA official years ago, that no model is good. However, some are useful. That's a great way to put it. Every model, you know, everybody touts the uh, European as being the uh, savior of the model world, when in reality, it did a poor job with uh, ELSA. It is not infallible when you look at Overall, the Hurricane Center uses what we call a consensus. It takes the four best or five best performing models and averages those out. And that average happens to be better than any single model. You think about it uh, in baseball, somebody that hits 400, that means they struck out, you know, six, six out of 10 times, you know, that would be failure in school. So uh, the models are not perfect, but uh, we try to use a consensus or an average to, uh, to make the forecast better. And I think Mary had a question too. Oh, I was just going to make a comment. We don't oh. have to worry about the storm surge. We're in Columbia, but we certainly have to worry about the rainfall and the wind, which Absolutely. the wind to me is very frightening. I guess if I won the coast, the water would be, but the wind is what frightens me so badly. Right. The wind and the rain are your primary threats there. If the track is to the west of you, then you got to worry about tornadoes as well. But the one thing you don't have to worry about, of course, is storm surge, like you said. Right. Exactly. Thank you so much. Thank you. Ed, thank you very much, buddy. Appreciate you coming on and sharing your knowledge with us today. You're welcome. Uh, thank you all. Yeah, I did post uh, your uh, uh, how they can find you on social media. So uh, check him out, guys. He uh, he is tremendous. So thank you, Ed. Thank all you right. All. So have a great day, Ed. You guys too. Take care. Bye bye. All right. So coming up next Monday, we have Mark. Eisengren, who is the public image chair from Rotary District 7750, who is going to be talking to us about a literacy camp that is in the upstate. On August 16th, Tom Ledbetter with the Rotary Leadership Institute. So with that being said, we're going to conclude today with the Rotary four-way test. 
of the things we think, say, or do? Is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? Have a great Monday. Stay dry. As Ed said, rain is on the way. See you next Monday for the next conversation with Rotary Action People. Take care, folks. That's a wrap.